الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا حادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله تعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد اقرا بسم ربك الذي خلق صدق الله العظيم وقال الله تعالى في شان حق حبيبه مخبرا وامرا ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصل عليه الصلاه والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله الصلاه والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله الصلاه والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا نبي الله وعلى اله واصحابه يا سيدي يا نور الله all praise all thanks to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the lord of the heavens and the earth and everything in between an infinite peace and salutations and blessings upon the last and final messenger rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his prophets and messengers with various miracles according to the situation and the state of the time <coughs> Musa alayhi salam a great prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was given the miracle of miracles because that was a time where people used to perform magic and trying to what they used to call miracles themselves perform magic and these things too deceive people to make people think something was the case when it wasn't so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted musa alayhi salam this power where the people were performing magic but what he was performing was a miracle from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which dealt with what the magicians and the people of pharaoh were putting forward and when the magicians saw the miracle of musa alayhi salam which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed upon him they knew that this could not be magic so they knew magic they knew how magic works so when they saw this 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 cannot be magic we know this cannot be done this cannot happen so this must be a miracle and they submitted and believed in the messengership of musa alayhi salam and acknowledged allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the lord and creator In the time of Isa alayhi salam the big thing then was to deal with medicine and healing the sick people healing the blind healing the leper healing people bringing the dead back to life this was the kind of thing that people were interested in medicine and such things so to deal with that and to convince the people of the truth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his mercy and fadl gave Isa alayhi salam the ability to perform miracles which were things like bringing the dead back to life which were like giving the sight back to the person who was blind and when the people the doctors and the people who used to deal with these kind of things saw what Isa alayhi salam was doing they knew that this could not be any form of magic either that this was truly something divine and truly something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we know this cannot happen how can somebody bring dead back to life it doesn't work like that unless it is with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now when it comes to 
our Nabi and our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all of these miracles in one. All of these miracles were given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are two special miracles that were also given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Now the ulama ikram say that the miracles that were given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that were also given to the other prophets and messengers wasn't anything big for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their maqam and bringing the dead back to life was nothing for them. This was a minor thing for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him. The ulama ikram say that there are two miracles that befitted the maqam on the level of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the miracles, one of the mojizat was that of the Qur'an Sharif itself. That the Qur'an was revealed upon the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was able to absorb and withhold the power and the might of the Qur'an. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that had we revealed it on a mountain, the mountain would have turned to dust. That's the power of the Qur'an being revealed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to absorb this and it was revealed on their chest mubarak. The second miracle that is befitting to the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is none other than Isra wal Miraj. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did the dar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He got to see the most unseen. You know people talk about ilm al ghaib But the most ghaib, the most unseen thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most unseen. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got to see the most unseen. So what else can be hidden away from him? What other ghaib, what other unseen can be hidden away from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed himself in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam befitting his majesty. So these two miracles that were bestowed upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam give you an indication of the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Qur'an was revealed and the very beginning of revelation when Jibreel alayhi salam came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his first word of revelation that he was bringing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Rasulullah was what? Iqra. Read. Read. This was the first word being revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we must ponder on this point, why did of all the words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose the word read? when revealing the revelation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There must be some significance in the word read. And this read is one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the main thing then was things like poetry, things like uh, eloquent speech. These were the kind of big thing at the time. People used to win people's hearts over by reciting poetry. People used to go into the courts of the noble people, the rich people, the wealthy people and praise them. They used to praise the kings. And they used to use poetry to do this. And they used to use eloquent speech to do this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa such eloquence in their speech, in their blessed words, that all of the people were overcome by the awe and the, the class and the quality and the beauty in the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was being revealed to him. And at that time, there was a, a purpose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an in the Arabic tongue. Because the Arabic language is such a rich language, no other language can compete with it or replicate it. There's no way. And when you study grammar and balagha, rhetoric and all of these things, you get to understand the beauty and the depth of the language Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an in. Now when we apply the Qur'an, to our lives, we have to assess the situation. Normally, we have a child, boy or girl, and at the age of five, we send them to the madrasa. They go to the madrasa, and the qari sahab, the imam at the madrasa, teaches them how to read Quran. When I was younger, they used to, sometimes people would finish the Quran maybe three years, eight years old, nine years old, people would finish the Quran. Nowadays, it takes a little bit longer, you know, maybe 10, 11, 12. The children aim for the age around 12 years old to finish the Qur'an. 
So now what they've done, between the age of 5 and 12, they've come to the masjid every day, they've learned how to read the Qur'an. And now, because they are coming closer to their GCSEs at school, they leave the masjid because the goal coming to the masjid is to finish reading the Qur'an. At least once or twice, the goal coming here is to finish a reading of the Qur'an. So they come, they read, and they leave. But have they understood the Qur'an? No. Have they understood the message in the Qur'an? No. Have they now equipped themselves with the teachings from the Qur'an? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huda lil muttaqeen. Guidance for the God feeling. Have they taken the, the guidance from the Qur'an? No. When they reach the age, if it's a girl, the minimum age is nine, and for a boy, the minimum age is 12. When they reach the age of puberty, when they become Bali, then we know that Salah becomes Farah. Fasting becomes Farah. If they own a certain amount of wealth according to the rules of Zakat, they also have to pay Zakat. And if they meet the criteria and the rules, and Hajj can also become Farah upon them as well. Because Islamically, the, where we draw the line of being a child and adulthood is at puberty. When they pass the age of puberty, then we say these people are adults now. They are classed as adults. So if they come to the masjid and the madrasa from the age of 5 to 12 to learn the Qur'an, not understand the Qur'an, then are they ready and equipped at the age of 12 to go about living life as an adult Muslim? How to pray? How to clean themselves? How to purify themselves? How to fast? What breaks a fast and what makes a fast? What type of wealth they need to give zakat on? What type of wealth they don't need to give zakat on? If they make a mistake in Salah, how do you correct that mistake? Do they know how to do these things? Do they know how to give Azan? Do they know how to read Ikama? Do they know how to lead the Salah? Do they know how to do a Janaza prayer? No. So, the question I ask myself, and you as well, is what are we getting them ready for? What are we getting them ready for? They come to the Masjid, age of five, they read Quran, okay. But we've not got them ready for the real purpose, the real job, the real role, which is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look, if you have a doctor, and the doctor starts practicing, is he going to start practicing before he studied, or after he studied? He's going to have to study and get qualified before he starts practicing. So as a Muslim, we have to start practicing definitely by the age of puberty. Let's say it's 12 years old. Let's say it's 14 years old. They have to start practicing as a Muslim at that age. That is the deadline. So all of the basic studying has to have taken place before that point. Where is that study? Where is that study going to come from? The parents complain that the masjids do not provide the right level of education. The masjids complain that the parents are not fully committed to bringing their children to the masjid. If I said to the madrasa now and said, in this madrasa we will not teach how to read Quran. We will teach how to understand the Quran. We will teach how to perform wuzu, ghusl, salah, azan, janaza, all of these things. Guaranteed nobody will send their kids to me. They won't. Because people are in this mindset that what you do when your child is five years old is you send them to the madrasa and they read the Quran. Look, look at it this way. Reading Quran, reading Quran is ibadat. Reading Quran is ibadat. No doubt in that. But at the most, it is sunnah. It is sunnah to read the Quran. It is not wajib. So for example, if somebody was born Muslim, reverted to Islam, lived their life, didn't learn how to read the Qur'an, didn't read the Qur'an in that way, but they learned enough to read Salah, they performed the Salah, keep, they keep, kept their fasts, you know, paid their Zakat, did their Hajj, that's fine, the person has fulfilled his obligations. The person has fulfilled his obligations, but he didn't read a word of Qur'an, it doesn't matter. In that sense, it doesn't matter. So what we do is we say, okay, Sunnah, reading the Qur'an is Sunnah, but we prioritize that above the Farq. We say, Zaruri hai tusan Qur'an paro, jau masjid Qur'an paro, the Qur'an parne. For the rest of the thing, what about them? So then we get to a situation because we've got our eye on the wrong objective. As a society, 
we got our eyes, every single masjid is in the same situation. When Pakistan, India here, at what point are we going to wake up and say, look, we're missing the point here. The point is for us to get them ready for being an adult Muslim by the age they get to adulthood. That is the aim. That is the objective. Not to teach them Quran and then when they leave the masjid, they forget how to read the Quran as well. So what we do is we put all our effort into them learning to read the Quran, which they're going to forget anyway. Rather than getting them ready for adulthood. Then they get to the age of 25, 30, and someone says to them, what are the faraid of wuzu? And they say, I don't know. Or they're so embarrassed that they don't speak. So you're telling me you're 30 years old, you passed the age of puberty around 15. So for 15 years, Salah has been found upon you. And you, for 15 years, don't know what the fara'id, what the compulsory aspects of making wuzu are. What have you been doing for the last 15 years? Have you just been washing your hands and that's it, Allahu Akbar? What have you been doing? Somebody has got to the age of 40 and he says, I don't know anything about zakat. I've never paid zakat in my whole life. So what have you been doing for the last 25 years? Then they come to learn at the age of 35, 40, and then have to backtrack and backpedal all the way to the age of 15 when they, all these obligations become fard upon them. I'm teaching Salah, and I'm speaking to the brothers and sisters who I'm teaching, I'm saying that Qaza Salah, Salah became fard upon you at the age of puberty. Now if you're 25 years old, and haven't read any Salah except Ramadan. Each year, Ramadan, you've read your Salahs. You've got to make all them Salahs up. Whose fault is that? Yours, your parents, the Imam at the Masjid. Whose fault is it? Why are we getting to the age of 25 and 30 and then realizing that we should have done X, Y, Z for the last 15 years? How much pressure does that put upon us? If we're even bothered, that is. So the point of me mentioning this today is so that we open our eyes as parents, as adults in our community who have the ability and influence to say, look, we have to get our priorities right. Somebody tell me what is the issue if we do not teach a child how to read Quran, but instead we teach him everything he needs to know, basic level about being ready for a Muslim, being a Muslim. We teach him Salah, he knows how to do Azan, he can read the Salah, everything he knows. We taught him a book like Nul Ida, which is covers all of the basic five pillars in detail. Tahara, Salah, Saum, Zakat and Hajj. But we're not getting our priorities right. And even after saying this, nothing will happen. Because we still think, oh well, it's too difficult to go against the norm. You know that all it takes is one person. All it takes is one masjid. All it takes is one group of people who say, yes, actually, we see the light, we see the sense in that. Our children are not being ready and equipped at the right age. We have a deadline. We have to equip them fully before we get to that deadline. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited to Huddersfield and there was a gathering of ulama. I went as a student to learn about what the ulama were talking about. And the topic was Islamophobia and the topic was the responsibility of the ulama in society. And many of the points that were raised, some of them were that a lot of our uh, Sunni youngsters are leaving our way, our belief and going towards other sects and other ways. And who is responsible for this? What is the solution for this? You see, the solution there are solutions out there, but they have to be tackled collectively. Parents, elders in the community, youngsters in the community, the masjid, the masjid committees, everybody has to get together and come up with the solutions to these problems. When a child comes to the masjid from the age of 5 to 12, 5 to 14, they have a reason to come here. What? To learn the Quran. <coughs> After the age of 14, what reason does a young boy or girl have to come to the masjid? Why should they come here? Dad's not reading namaz, mom's not reading namaz. People go to the masjid to read namaz. So why should a youngster come to the masjid? There's no reason for them. Is there a homework club here? No. Is there a computer here they can use? No. Is there a library here they can use? No. 
Is there a youth club here they can use? No. Not talking about this masjid, generally. Are there facilities for them to come and use? No. Why are they going to come here? And when they go to the people of the other sects, they'll go in and say, here's a pool table. Let's read Salah first and we'll play a game of pool. Then we'll have a cup of tea and have something to eat. Then we'll go and play some football together. And then we'll come back and read another Salah again. Then we'll go and play some table tennis. Things that the youngsters like to do. Activities. And mixing that with the Salah as well. Say, look, we're going to read the Salah, we can do this. We're going to get a balance of both things. Giving them reasons as to why they want to go there. We've got a computer here that you can use. Do your homework on. We'll help you with certain things that you need. Academic help. Your secular studies as well. We'll do GCSE revision classes. So they now have a link with the masjid. And they have a reason to want to come here. And this is what we miss. And this is where the concentration needs to go on. This is where the focus needs to be. That the masjid should not only be a place of worship. It should be a place where all of the needs of the Muslim community are met. Look, if somebody is hungry, he should be able to come to a masjid and get fine food to eat. Do you agree or disagree? A hungry person, Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter where he's from, Eastern European, whatever. He is hungry, he is in need of food, he can come to the masjid and he should be able to get some food here. This is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anybody has any type of need, somebody needs some clothing, they will come here and we can give them some clothing. Whatever the needs are of the community, we can fulfill the needs. That's how we capture the heart of the people. By serving the people and serving the communities. Anybody has a need, they can come. I was in Huddersfield a few months back and a brother came in and he spoke to the, the Sadr of the Masjid and said, look, I need some money. I've, got, uh, I've applied for some benefits. I don't have any money on me whatsoever. And I have a family, I have children. I've come to the Masjid for some help. So the uncle who's the, the Sadr there of the president of the Masjid, he spoke to me. I went there for Juma Bayan. And he said, what do you think? What should I do? Because if I just give him money, he might go and spend it on something wrong. What should I do? I said, Uncle, what to do? After Juma, let's take him to the local supermarket or convenience store. Say to him, whatever you want, buy, we'll pay for it. Allah. Buy whatever he wants. We're not giving him the money. We'll go to the shop with him. Whatever he wants, bread, milk, eggs, we'll buy him for him. Give him them and say, off you go. We're not just going to say, no, we don't believe you. Because at the end of the day, he's come with the Umid. He's come with the hope. He's a Muslim as well. He's come to the masjid with this hope in his heart that I will go to Allah's house. And maybe I will get something to deal with my needs from Allah's house. So let's go and look after him in this way. And we did exactly that. He was happy. Now he's a namazi at that particular masjid. Why? Because of a link at that masjid. And you say, oh, you the fire. Oh, and said, I said, Are they going to come back to your masjid now? What, what are they going to come there for? So the masjids have to be a, a, a community hub where people can come and find shelter, find s solutions to their problems and they can have their needs fulfilled. This is how we will keep our generations and our youngsters intact with our masjids and our establishments. We don't have a situation where we have a, a masjid and a, a youth club. How many Islamic youth clubs are there in, the, in Bradford? Bradistan as they call it, meaning all the Pakistanis and the Muslims are in Bradford. So many people here. But what is there in Bradford that we have created to serve the needs of our community? Nothing very much. And then when we get to a situation where our children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren are like the Christians now and saying, yeah, granddad used to go to a mosque. But, you know, uh, I went once when I was, uh, you know, young, but I don't go anymore, I don't believe in it. Like they do now, they say, my grandma used to go to the church and read the Bible. I've got a Bible at home somewhere, but I'm not, I don't believe anything. I'm not interested. Why did they, they end up in that situation? Because they kept their children away from the establishments, their churches. Now, all the churches are being sold and turned into masjids. And there is a fear, a real fear. 
that the churches we are buying turning into masjids might soon be bought by other other people and generations and we might end up having to sell the masjids because they're empty and we can't do anything with them. And we've got children who say that, yeah, we don't believe in anything. We believe in Darwin's theory. We believe that our ancestors were apes and monkeys. That's the situation we will end up in. Because the only Islamic education we are giving our children is how to read the Quran. I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. It's not good enough for us to only teach them how to read Quran. You know, when I was at work, people used to ask me, uh, have you read the Quran? Yes. Do you understand the Quran? And I said, no. At that point, I didn't. I said, no. Well, what did they teach you at the mosque then? Because they're just asking random questions. What did they teach you at the mosque? Or they just teach you how to read. So they don't teach you what it means, or so you're reading something you don't understand. Well, yeah. And you think to yourself, actually, how silly does that sound? That actually reading something I don't understand, and I'm probably never going to understand. Because I'm never going to get this time back again. That's the point where I decided, actually, I'm going to go and understand what I'm reading. And then try my level best to implement what I'm reading. But I'm doing that at the age of 25, 27. What about all the, maybe, you know, quarter, two-thirds of the life that has already passed away? So we have to wake up to our responsibilities as adults and make sure that we are serving the youngsters in the right way. And this is where the parents have to understand as well. It's not about going to the masjid only and read, getting your children to read the Quran. So you can say to your relatives, Ji Quran Hatam Kitas, Matai Kau, Gulab Jamun. Because you're happy now that they've read the Quran. Samji ask Kodi. Similar thing when we come to hips. People send their children to the masjids to do hips. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. That they have, they have read the Quran. Those who understand the Quran, I'm not belittling any hafiz. I'm not saying that they are, you know, anything bad about them. What I'm saying in reality, what I'm speaking to you openly and plainly, a half is, Alhamdulillah, he's done hips. His parents put him down that road, he's done it. Or he's done it by himself. Does he understand it? No. How many of us are wanting to make our children half is, but not wanting to make them an alim, somebody who understands the Quran? No, but we, we're going for that thing which sounds good to the community. Even in the ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the way of Allah Almighty, we want that thing that follows the trend. We want that thing that sounds good to the people. But what about understanding? What about implementing? What about following the Quran as it ought to be followed? And this is why Islamophobia comes about as well. And this is the final point I will touch on. You see, Islamophobia basically means a fear of, or you feel a, a fear of or an anger towards Islam. Somebody has a fear or a, a, feels anger towards Islam. You see, you have something called arachnophobia. You also have something called agrophobia. Arachnophobia is when you are scared of spiders. When you're scared of spiders. You feel they might harm you, do something to you, so you're scared of spiders. And one of the ways the psychologists deal with this uh, agrophobia and arachnophobia is called exposure therapy. What they do is, for example, they love a spider really far away. Or they might show you a picture of a spider. It's not a real spider, it's just a picture. Look at it. It's not going to harm you, it doesn't do anything. It's look how small it is. Look how big you are. Then they'll have a spider far away and say, look at that. It's not going to harm you from there. Then after a little while, when they build the person up and make them more exposed, they say, let's go and see it. It's in a box. It's not going to hurt you. Then slowly, slowly, they're getting the person to now hold the spider in their hand and say, look, it's not going to do anything. So through exposure therapy, they allow the person to overcome their fears. And we have to do the same thing with those people who are Islamophobic. Those people who are scared of Islam, have fear toward Islam, we have to expose them to Islam in the right way. So they can sit with a Muslim and say, Chak he doesn't, a Muslim doesn't bite. He's just a person like me and you, but he has certain beliefs and these are his beliefs. But we have to be the right people to be exposed to. When we are the people that the non-Muslims are being exposed to, we have to be proper followers of Islam. We have to be proper followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So when they are exposed, they come close and not run away. We have to be the right kind of people that when they are exposed to us, they say, what were we worrying about? Look at the beauty in these people. Look at the respect in these people. These truly are the followers of uh, a great messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I pray that I first and foremost act upon what I have said. And as a community, we all understand what is being said as well. And we have further conversation between ourselves to look for a proper solution to the problem. And it doesn't matter what any other masjid is doing. It doesn't matter what any other madrasa is doing. We have an opportunity as a community here to do something that is truly going to benefit our, our children and our future generations. That will not only benefit them in this life, but in the hereafter as well. Please start to fill the gaps and perform your sunnah. Jazakallah.
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad. Zahra, 
وعلى أميه المكرمين الحمزة والعباس وعلى كل من اختاره وبصحبته نبيهم بالإيمان والآن تجعل في قلوبنا للا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفخشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وأعز وأجل وأتم وأهم وأعز وأكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا على السلا هيا على السلا هيا على الفلا هيا على الفلا القام تسلات القام تسلات الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ألا إن أولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون لهم البشرى في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة لا تبديل لكلمات الله ذلك هو الفوز العظيم الله
وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الله سبحان الله لمن حمده السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله سلام 
वाले उनके पाकिस्तान ने ख्याल फरमा दोस्त जिनका कोई भी दुआ करने वाला नहीं हम सब की दुआ के हक में कबूल मंजूर फरमा उम्मत मुसलमान जितने भी कल मंगो ईमान की हालत में उफात पागे तमाम दी बख्श फरमा हजूर पी के Thank <laughs> you. 